everyone. I hope you guys are having a blessed day today. Um, just want to give you guys the gospel. It is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. And thus that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and on the third day rose from the dead for our justification. Jesus always existed. He is the second person of the Godhead. We see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus was born of a virgin, wrapped himself in flesh, lived a perfect life, never sinned, and shared his precious blood on the cross of Calvary for the forgiveness of all our sins, past, present, and future, and to reconcile us back to God. Why does he need to reconcile us back to God? Because, you see, we are born into sin, because when Adam disobeyed God, sin entered into the world. So everyone that is born is born into sin. Everyone that is born of a man. What I mean by that? It takes two. Right? Well, Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit. So there was no man involved. So he is without sin. He is righteous right from birth. He is God the Son right from birth. That means he is 100% God and 100% man at the same time right at birth. Okay? Keep that in mind. Now, man, however, when we are born, we are born into sin. So, by God's standards of righteousness, none of us are without fault. And we cannot be with fault if we are to enter heaven. We have to be made righteous and perfect in the eyes of God. That is the only way we can be justified is through Jesus Christ, our faith in him. Okay? So you see, we need Jesus Christ to enter heaven. Without Christ, you will not see heaven. You will be eternally separated from God into a place called hell and ultimately the second death, lake of fire. You see, this message is not about scaring people into believing. It's about letting you know what is already done. Okay? Your job now is just to believe what God has done for you on your account. This is so important because it will tie into what I'm going to tell you guys today. The gospel is so simple, and yet many deny the gospel. Seem like you guys have trust issues. Seem like you have trust issues. This can also be found with the children of Israel. You know, when you go back to the Old Testament, before the children of Israel went into captivity, God was calling on them, warning them, giving them all kinds of messages from the prophets. Different prophets, not just one, multiple prophets reaching out to the children of Israel. They will not listen. God warned and warned and warned. They will not listen. God even trying to help them, letting them know judgment is coming. I want you guys to leave. This, they will not listen to God either. They rejected everything because they do not trust God. Okay? And finally, God was like, okay, well, it's time for your judgment. It cost them 70 years in Babylonian captivity because Nebuchadnezzar, who, by the way, was a pagan king, and also God considered him his sword on earth. God is the one that used him to bring judgment. Okay? So, you see, children of Israel goes into captivity for 70 years. And at the end of the captivity, there's a new king, King Cyrus. Matter of fact, let's go to it. In chapter 1 of Ezra, you find that King Cyrus makes a decree. But he didn't just make a decree. It was God who do, is doing that. How do I know that? Because the Bible says so. Look at this. I want you to see this. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, Jeremiah the prophet, might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. See that? The Lord stirred up this. So, again, God is one in control here, guys. Okay? Stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, 
the Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Again, he's acknowledging God, okay? And he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is there among you of all his people. His God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord, God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remains in any place where he sojourns, let the man of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with animals, besides a free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Anyway, if you read further down, then it kind of it goes more in details into that. Okay, I just want to kind of give you like a quick backdrop. All right, so obviously the children of Israel, you know, this was very good for them. You know, good news after seventy years of captivity, you know, in Babylon. Now they're returning back to Jerusalem. Okay. They returned back to Jerusalem, and all the stuff that was taken from them, okay, everything that was taken from the temple, is returned back to them so that they can use it to rebuild the temple. And by the way, I'm going to show you something also. Everything that they were doing, it did not cost them a dime. It was literally the king's money is what's used to rebuild the temple. Why is that important? See? The king of Nebuchadnezzar, the king Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, destroyed the temple. First temple. Okay? So God made it to where the king is going to pay for the rebuilding of the second temple. Whoever is the current king. Okay? It gets better. So you see, when God sets something in motion, here comes, here comes the enemy. Never fails. We can translate that into a New Testament ministry as well. You know, Satan thing by using Judas, he can stop God. Okay? Remember, Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. Why was Satan doing that? Why Why was he even, what was his purpose of tempting Jesus? Okay? He knew who Jesus was. So it, it wasn't like he was trying to figure him out or trying to, you know, test him. No, he knew who he was full well. Satan ain't, ain't stupid. Okay? He knew him full well, but yet he was testing him before it. Why? Trying to what? Disrupt the plan of God. That's all it is. If I can disrupt the plan of God, I won. That's his mind. That's that's what Satan thinks. Okay? Even though <laughs> he knows that God never missed a beat. But in his mind, his delusional mind, he believes that if he can change one thing, he already won. He just won victory. That's all he wants. Victory of some sort against God. And he, he thought he almost got that victory when Jesus was crucified until the third day. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I can't even imagine what his face looked like when that tomb cracked open and Jesus rose again on the third day. <laughs> Anyway, back to what I'm talking about here. I just want you to know Satan is always going to be there to try to disrupt the plan of God. But God, being the one he is and the one who is the author and finisher of our faith, who is the one that begins everything, who owns salvation, we're going to see everything to completion. I'm getting somewhere. So you see in Ezra, there were people who were against you know, them building, rebuilding the temple. Okay? And this people made it very clear. They did not like them. Now, these people are full on aware of the decree that King Cyrus made. Okay? Now, here's what's crazy. After the reign of Cyrus, you got his brother, um, I guess it's his, his brother or his son, Darius. Okay? We all know they're related. Okay? Darius, who is this new king, right? So they wanted to stop the building of this temple, but the children of Israel was building anyway. So this this group of people who were, I felt like they were sent by Satan, you know, always people trying to stop you from moving forward with God's plan, okay? Always there, trying to discourage you from moving forward. We see that. But this group of people comes 
I'm pretty much trying to discourage them, you know, because, you know, they were like, you know, governors and stuff, you know, of the of that area. So, of course, you know, trying to put a halt to the building and trying to stop it. Well, that didn't pan out too well. So in chapter six, well, actually in chapter five, that's when they went to, um, you know, confront them. So what they did was they wrote this long letter when the people was telling them why they were rebuilding this temple and that it was a decree made by Cyrus, even though they know that, they know that, okay? They know that Cyrus made a decree because the decree was not something that was secret. It was publicly done, okay? It was public. Everyone knew that King Cyrus has sent them back to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple, okay? Everyone knew that. Because the king's decree is not a secret decree. It is a public declaration. And he's put in writing, okay? With the king's probably um, uh, signatory stamp or something like that, you know, that the kings have, you know, at the time. So here's what happens next in chapter 6. After they already, this group of people wrote a letter to King Darius now. And then they are suggesting to King Darius to search the house. Of the king to see if they can, if, if, if that decree is there to prove that what these people are saying is true. They already know that King Cyrus made a decree, but I feel like the reason why they're doing that is they are hoping, since this is a new king now, that decree is not going to be found. And since if, if it's not found, then they can halt this whole building of the temple. Like I said, what well, God starts, he finishes. Look at this. Let's read 6. Then there is a king made a decree, and, and search was made in the house of the scrolls, where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. And there was found at Ekbana, Ekbatana, in the palace that is in the province of the Medes, a scroll. And in it was a record thus written. Hey, hey, it is. In the first year of Cyrus the king, the same Cyrus the king made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be built, the place where they offered sacrifices, and let its foundation be strongly laid, its height, three score, which is 60 cubits, and its breadth, three score cubits. So again, three score is 60, okay? One score is 20, okay? So just so you guys know. With three rows of great stones and a row of new timber, let and let the expenses be given out of the king's house. Remember what I told you guys that God used the king <laughs> to rebuild it. So it's not the children of Israel paying for the rebuilding of the temple. The king get to pay for it. Even though King Cyrus wasn't the one that destroyed it, but the king of Babylon did. Nebuchadnezzar since the king of Babylon destroyed the temple. Well, guess what? The king is going to rebuild it. He's going to pay for it. This is all God's doing. See, when he does stuff, he does it to where you don't have to stress about it. He got it. And we need to learn to start trusting him in that manner. Peep this though. And also let the golden and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took forth out of the temple, which is at Jerusalem, and brought unto Babylon, be restored and brought again unto the temple, which is at Jerusalem. Everyone to its place and place them in the house of God. Now, therefore, Tetanai, governor beyond, these are the little punks over here. Tetanai, governor beyond the river, Shetar Bozanai, and your companions, the governors who are beyond the river, keep yourselves far from there. This is the King Darius decree right now, okay? He's, again, since he already found out the truth, these punks right here, that's exactly what they are, trying to stop the building of the temple and got nothing better to do. I mean, it's like these people were joyful, they're excited, and heck, here they come. The enemy's right hand man coming to trying to tell them, you better not build our temple. How dare you trying to put up a wall and lay the foundation? What's wrong with you guys? You know, this ain't your land no more. Does that sound familiar? Keep reading. This is King Darius, still writing. Let the work of this house of God alone, it's warning them. Let the governors of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in its place. Okay? 
Moreover, here's his decree now. Again, God's doing. I love this. Moreover, I make a decree of what you shall do for the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God. That of the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river, without delay, expenses be given unto these men. Talking about those men who came to lay a, a complaint and charge against the Jewish people who were burning the temple. Now he's putting them into a place where they get to serve them now. They get to serve the Jewish people now. Okay? <laughs> can you imagine the anger in their spirit? But there's nothing they can do because when the king makes a decree, if you go against that, you get your head chopped off, man, or worse. Okay? <laughs> but that's a dead person. If you go against the king, you're dead. <laughs> but look what it says here. That of God. Okay, okay. Just, just, now look what it says. And that which has, which they have need of, both young bullocks and rams and lambs and the burnt offerings of the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, and oil, according to the requirements of the priests who are at Jerusalem. Let it be given them day by day without fail, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet aroma unto the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and of his sons. Also, I have made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word, let timber be pulled down from his house and being set up, let him be impaled thereon. Means while you're in your house, they're going to destroy your house and let your whole building fall on you and pretty much kill you. <laughs> and let his house be made a pile of rubble because of this. And the God that has caused his name to dwell there destroy all kings and people that shall put their hand to alter it. And to destroy this house of God, which is at Jerusalem, I, Darius, have made a decree. Let it be done diligently. Now, I want to talk about something. So you see how this decree went out? It was just amazing. Where the enemy planned for good. I mean, for evil, I'm sorry. God turned it for good. We see that happen over and over and over. Okay? We know who is the king of the universe. God is. Who is the king of kings and lord of lords? Jesus is, right? God is. So guess what? When God has made a decree concerning the gospel, stating, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is a decree from God the King. Okay? God himself. God the Father. This means this cannot be retracted. Once it is spoken, it is yes and amen. It's done. And it is written. You notice when Satan tempted Jesus, he always says, it is written. It is written. Because what's written cannot be undone. Okay? So, the gospel that we believe, that God has given to us by simply believing by faith alone. Believing, that's all it is. There's no complication in believing. So anyone that's trying to separate believing and trying to create something else from it, they're not listening to God, guys. Okay? I'm sorry. They can claim to be a Christian all day. You're not listening. Don't try to complicate the words of God when he is very clear. God is capable enough to say exactly what he wants to say and mean exactly what he wants to say. You don't need to Stand there and turn and say, well, really, God really meant this. He really didn't mean it the way you're reading it. No, he really, no. Believing is believing. End of subject. Okay? If I step outside and the sun is, is, is as bright as it can be, I can't turn and say, well, you know what? That's the moon over there. No, it is a freaking sun because I can see it. It's the sun. It's hot. And I will be a crazy person telling people, that is not the sun, guys. It is the moon. People are going to be looking at me like I'm crazy. This is how we look at those people who keep denying the gospel and trying to make it what it's not. Like, you guys are insane. Because it's hard to try to wrap your head around that. Like, 
How are you not seeing this? You can argue up and down. The gospel never changes. When God makes a decree, that decree is something that we must keep. It's a must. There's not an option there, you know, to get into heaven. That is the only means to enter heaven. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That is a decree. Simple as that means no man in John 14, 6. You're not making it into heaven without Jesus Christ. Period. And Jesus said, if you love me, right, then keep my words. Keep my commandments. What was the commandment? We find out in, in 1 John, right? The commandment is what? To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and to love one another. But most importantly, the faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you see, the gospel is not just about, oh yeah, well, well Jesus died on the cross, yeah, but then, but you must do your part. No, the gospel is faith alone. That's it. The thief on the cross didn't have to do nothing else but believe. Oh, well, that's a different scenario because he was dying. You are out of your mind, okay? You are out of your mind. God doesn't make different decrees for different people. The decree that he made for salvation is one gospel. That's it. It's not, okay, this gospel for these people here, this gospel for these people here. So there's multiple gospels. No, Jesus died once and for all. Once and for all. Salvation is received by one means only. Faith alone in the finished work of Jesus Christ. What he has done. What he has completed. Remember what I was saying. God finishes what he starts. He is the one in control. What did the Bible tell us? Salvation belongs to the Lord. King David said that. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Okay? So it is him that's doing the giving of salvation. And by what means he chooses to. And then he makes a decree. Say, hear ye, hear ye. This is what you need to do to receive salvation. And forgiveness of sins, past, present, and future, once and for all. And many still do not want to listen to the king. They deny, they deny, and they deny. You see, some of y'all sit and talk about the children of Israel, how, oh man, how rebellious they are, and this and that. Oh man, I can't believe they don't believe in God, you know, and this and that. You are doing the exact same thing when you reject the gospel. You are doing the exact same thing. So next time you talk about the children of Israel, how, man, they did this. Oh, I, I can't believe they deny the words of Jesus. Look in the mirror. Until you believe the gospel, look in the mirror. Because you're speaking to yourself as well. You understand? The Bible is very clear. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works. Let's in the man should boast. So when people tell you you must repent of your sins to be saved, that is works. That is works. Oh my goodness, Chuck, you are tripping. Really? I'm tripping? Oh my goodness, I did not know that. Well, if that's the case, if I'm tripping, guess what we're going to do? We are going to go to Wonderful Book. You know who books we're going to go to? Jonah. You know which chapter we're going to go to? Chapter 3. You know what verse we're going to go to? Verse 10. Okay? Look at this. Actually, let's start behind, you know, before that. I want to I want to show you guys what works when God's talk about not of works, less any man should boast. Okay? In Ephesians 2 at 9. This is the works he's talking about. Let's start with verse 8. But let man and beast be covered. This is the, the the king of Nineveh, obviously, is talking about this. Let men and beasts be covered with sackcloth and cry madly unto God because God was going to bring judgment upon Nineveh. Remember the whole story of Jonah? Okay. Yeah, let him turn everyone from his evil way. That's repenting of their sinful ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Okay? That means you got to stop doing something. Stop sinning. Stop doing this. Stop doing that, right? And look what happened. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. Because God was about, 
God was about to bring a hammer down, okay, on Nineveh. And peep this, guys. Here is a kicker. And God saw their what? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Ooh. What did God see again? Oh, their works, huh? Their works. What works was there? Were they preaching the gospel to each other? Oh, no, 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 no. They ain't works. What works did God see? That they stopped. You see the previous verse where the king decreed what they need to stop doing? So obviously they stopped doing that and they were repenting of those. And God saw their works. Okay? Look what he says next. That they turned from the evil way. And God relented of the disaster that he has said that he was that he will bring upon them and he did and, and, and he did it not. Okay? So you see, works. Repenting of sin is works. The Bible makes it very clear, not by works, lest any man should boast. So you can't say, look what I stopped doing this. So when someone is telling you you must repent of your sins to be saved, they're lying to you. That is not the gospel. Because to repent of your sins means to turn from it completely. Well, I'm sorry, when you are in a fallen state, you cannot turn from sins. People do eventually begin to start repenting of certain sins. Not all, but certain sins in their lives after they have been saved. Because now the Holy Spirit is doing work in them, bringing these things to the surface so that it can be tackled and removed from their lives. But it's the Holy Spirit that does that. You cannot do anything to save yourself. If you could save yourself before receiving salvation, then you don't need Jesus Christ. Do you see what I'm saying? We have to be careful who we listen to or with ministry we, we, we associate ourselves with. The gospel is nothing short of faith alone. There's no repenting of sins. Oh, what well, Jesus said, repent of sins. Jesus did not say repent of sins. He says, repent for the kingdom of God. Uh, well, I said, no, he said, repent and believe the gospel. That's what Jesus said. And he wasn't talking about repent of sins, talking about change your minds. He's telling that to these Pharisees who are boneheaded, man. They ain't trying to hear it. You know, when people think that they're right, and no matter what you tell them, they ain't going to listen to you, man. You don't argue with them. Make your statement and keep it pushing. Keep it pushing. We see that theme throughout the Bible. They don't get into debates. Even Paul t tells you not to debate people. So why are some Christians trying to debate, trying to prove something to anyone? You have nothing to prove to no one. Just share the gospel. If they don't believe the gospel, tell them the reason why I need to believe. If they reject the gospel, then let them reject it. That's on them. Your job is not to convince someone so you can walk around and say, look what, man, I saved someone. No one can save anyone. You didn't save anyone. Neither can you save anybody, even if you tried. God is one doing the saving because salvation belongs to the Lord. Okay? So again, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The gospel is always the key. And that will always determine where a person is going, heaven or hell. Believe the gospel, you enter heaven. You'll be reconciled back to God. Deny the gospel and reject it. You still remain in your current state condemned. Choice is yours today. Know this. God always finishes where he starts. Anyway, and he will see it to completion. But most importantly, even when things seem that is out of whack, trust God. He got you, people. He's not blind to your problems. God knows exactly what you're going through, the struggles, all of that. He understands. Some of y'all want out of here like so bad. All of us do. But you know what? We don't live our life wishing and looking, oh, I need to go like yesterday, yesterday, yesterday. Yeah, well, it, it would be nice to be gone right now. But that is not how we live, though. We don't live based on that. We live based on enjoying and literally living for Christ now. We have him now with us. So we need to enjoy him now until he comes. That's the only place you can find peace is resting in Christ. Okay? Without resting in Christ, you have no peace. You have no peace. Because everything else out there in the world will bring you 
<laughs> and unrest in your spirit. God bless.